It's not bad. It's not bad. Man, we are live. <laughs> no one's watching. I don't know if no one's here yet, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, I'm gonna, I'm gonna look up a few, few things still. Oh, we might have, might have a few people, people watching. Hello. <laughs> uh, really glad if, if anyone's here. Uh, oh yeah, we got three waves. Three waves in. What is up, film lovers? <laughs> uh, we are here at Tim Pan Theater. My name is Dan Williams. I'm Todd Lizer. And we are film nerds. Film nerds. <laughs> we're we're doing a doing a live Q and A here on Instagram. It's our first time doing it, and we're gonna figure out if we actually can do it. I know this is a. It's good that our theme this week is experimental film because this is going to be a very experimental experience as yeah. it's our first time doing this. But so, feel free to leave any feedback or um, notes, something you might want next time. Yep. Yeah. We don't know for sure if we can. We're 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 gonna gonna mainly be talking and uh, talking about this movie, um, and we we would like to be able to talk back and forth to the, over subjects that people will probably want to hear about for this movie and then maybe later we might just pull the camera off and see what people are talking about that you want us to, to say yeah so we were we were kind of thinking that we'll probably run until 6 30 and we'll spend the first uh the first half discussing this film between ourselves kind of a communication between our different perspectives on breathless and the art film movement uh, from French New Wave and German Expressionism. And then the last 15, we'll open it up for you to ask us some questions. And we'll probably have to take it off this <laughs> Dutch angle here. <laughs> and we'll just hold it here and, and look at your questions and hopefully answer them. Yep. All right. So, yeah, why, why are we here? What, what's, what's, what's the occasion that we're here doing this Q&A, Dan? Well, if you, this seems so scripted, we're like doing this so flawlessly. So if you, I hope those of you that are tuned in watched my lecture that is on the Ben Film feed right now. So you could even go watch the lecture and tune back in. I think it's like 11 minutes. Um, and this week I focused on the history of art cinema and the the next three weeks will essentially be the same thing but i'll be focusing on different countries so this week was just an introductory course uh lecture on what is art film how can we classify art film and what what made it so what where did the terminology begin and who is important in the in the production of this this whole theory so I focus on French New Wave and French critics, French theorists, as well as uh, early American uh, critics that were influenced by the French New Wave and then kind of went backwards and talked about German expressionists, German expressionism, um, how they were clearly an influence on French New Wave as well as pretty much the birth of experimental film. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the first major uh, art film movement. It's usually German Expressionism, expressionism in, in around the, the 20s and 30s, directly after the First World, World War. Um, and, and, and while that, in retrospect, is, is the first, um, our first ma major one, it is definitely with uh, French New Wave in the 50s and 60s where the critical eye of film criticism really begins and shapes the way we still talk about film criticism today uh, and, the, and the way that um, they were the ones who really started to identify these, these movements that had already happened and then that would continue to happen afterwards. Right, and also for those of you that don't know Todd, he has his master's in film and you are a German film guru. Uh, you, you love German expressionism. I I I guess you know a I, lot about it. I, I feel love. Like. I mean, so I was I was lucky enough to actually teach film history for for two years, and so there are there's 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 several movements that I feel like I know a good amount about. And that, German German expressionism. Yeah, yeah, German expressionism is definitely one that I mean I I, I can definitely cover cover the basics, and I can, uh, yeah, give 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 anyone 
I can give the layman a good good understanding of, of German expressions. I, I feel confident enough, at least, at yeah. least so, far, so far that much goes. So those of you that are new tuning in, we're going to discuss for the first 15 minutes about French New Wave and German Expressionism, and then open up a discussion about Breathless, the film I signed, and we'll kind of touch on that um, about 6.15. So I'm just going to keep doing it. I don't have no. to like keep touching it. Uh, Sorry, everyone, <laughs> if you're still there. Just bear, just bear with us. All right, us. we're having some tech difficulties. I'll probably have to be like tapping this. Screen. Yeah, I mean, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll just try and scoot forward every now and then, and and, and keep this going. Uh, before we get get into it, real, real deep. Uh, just want to uh, say that uh, we are doing this in Tin Pan, Tin Pan Theater. Uh, this is one of the things that we're trying to do since we can't hold regular things in here. Uh, and we also want to thank uh, Blockbuster for giving us these cool face masks that we are we wearing today uh, because they're a great partner. And if you support Ben Film and support Tin Pan, you probably also support Blockbuster. Uh, and we thank you, for, thank you for doing that. All of, all of Tin Pan Theater's films come from Blockbuster, yeah, so we all, work all, hand all, in hand with them. All of our, all of our retrospectives or, or, or when we're showing... Physical, showing, DVDs. Yeah, any, anytime we're showing something off of a DVD, we're, 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 we're getting it from Blockbuster. All right, let's talk some art film. And I'm not to yeah, we're literally. Just, we're, we're just gonna we're just gonna keep doing okay. that. Well, hey, we're I'm, gonna we're gonna pull it up. Sorry we're gonna do guys. Stuff now. We're uh. Again. So. I'm not gonna keep touching this screen to make sure it doesn't die on all of our loyal viewers. We thank you so much again. So. Oh, right. that's great. Hey, what do you know? That's not bad. All right. Now we're cozy. We'll just, we'll just kind of, yeah, something like that. Okay. There we go. Um, so, uh, Dune. So, the main Fr uh, French New Wave directors, such as Truffaut and Godard, were uh, critics before they became filmmakers. Right. Um, but what was what was sort of the the environment that? motivated these these critics to become filmmakers themselves and what was their what was their intent or, or and, and and what ultimately sort of influence did they have when when they were making movies as opposed to what modern french cinema was at the time well they were essentially critiquing french movies at the time that were that were lacking experimentation and and staying in this kind of set of conventional um guidelines which i think they were responding mainly to hollywood because you know film noir was the golden age of hollywood is in you know 1930s 19, yeah. early 1940s yeah i think about the time that that french new wave kicks off like old, old hollywood is sort of just coming to its waning days is my understanding right so i think these french critics such as jean-luc godard and francois truffaut we're also responding to the lack of innovation that was happening in Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Would you say that's? that's I think correct? so. I, th I think they were they were definitely making overt references to Hollywood and using a lot of what they saw in in, in Hollywood films and recontextualizing it in, in in ways that they they thought was more interesting sometimes. Right. Because um, I think one of the things that sometimes the French New Wave is gets gets noted for. Uh, and, and usually gets talked about if you see a French wave film for the first time, such as Breathless, is its editing. And right. the, way, the way that that movie cut things so much quicker at, su at su such a faster pace than Hollywood movies did, because usually before that time, there was a sense that you would have to see characters go from point A to point B, and you would see all this movement, whereas Breathless just took all of the dead air out of there, essentially. Right, and don't you feel like, I don't know if this was adopted from film noir, but especially in Breathless, these scenes are so slow <laughs> and they're so, they're so intimate where we're pretty much in the room with them for almost, some of these scenes feel like they go on for about 15, 10 to 15 minutes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And there's no, there's no consistent tempo of getting to the next part of the plot or the next character that we haven't seen in a while to come back in. It's, it doesn't yeah, matter, it's, essentially. Yeah, it's a movie that's maybe more interested in the musings of its characters, what, like, 
what what its characters are thinking about rather than actually having a plot to have to move forward. Right. Um, it's it's it feels comfortable. Yeah, just just being in a room room with two characters talking. Right, like the scene of Patricia and Michelle mm -hmm. in her bedroom. In her apartment, yeah. Which was kind of confusing because you think that Patricia wants nothing to do with him. She's mm -hmm. totally playing hard to get, and then it, she it, changes. Yeah, it, it's definitely a movie about uh, two people who don't really see eye to eye. They they don't they don't have the same same view of the world. And they're infatuated with each other. It's, it seems, um, and and they, and but they can never they can never actually actually see eye to eye to eye. And so it's why the st is the story is about them being doomed to ever actually be something together. Right. Um, and and why the character of, of Michelle, yeah, is, is is doomed, doomed no matter what. Did we have did we have a question there possibly, or someone just giving us cool? It was a appreciation. It was a comment on the style of filming and how intimate and raw a bit fickle and dreamy mm. i definitely have read a lot about how uh when jean godard shot breathless they they did a lot of handheld camera which which was very uncommon in french cinema at the time they also shot silently so that they could move the camera really quickly and get shots from angles that were pretty uncommon for cinema and then they would rec record all the audio later that's okay and yeah. that was a technique when did they when did they finally evolve from that technique like like when when did that become more of a standard or when when did when when did they actually get to record sound on set i mean they they they, they would record all the dialogue in post so after they, they after they had shot everything that's just crazy yeah on on set then they would go back and redub all the dialogue that's just crazy. And I don't, I don't, I don't know if that was necessarily for the whole movie, but definitely, I think just about every every time where they were shooting outside in the streets, right, was was yeah, shot silently, diegetic. Yeah, 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 and then and then they re-recorded all the audio later. Huh. Um, yeah, and so again, that it, it's a combination of quick editing. Um, sometimes you know conversations are are edited in the middle of it so that you know you're not even getting one actor's continued performance, you're getting a, like a, a chopped cut up performance. And then all uh, camera, camera shots from so many different angles um, that, that those things together were really a, almost a rejection of modern cinema practices so that, that things didn't feel so stale anymore. What do we got? What do we got? Uh -oh. Someone's... Someone's trying to be live with us. Oh, Sorry. No. Sorry, homies. You know, this is our first time. We, again, we appreciate everyone for tuning in, and we're figuring this out as we go. Uh, yeah, th again, thanks for being here for this live Q&A, if you're, if you're just tuning in. And, uh, yeah, we are, we are going to hopefully improve as, as things go. So, so stick with us, everyone. We appreciate it. Something that I also thought was very interesting that, and I've seen Breathless about three times. Mm -hmm. My fourth, I think it was my fourth time watching it this weekend. Um, there's a scene in the beginning when a young girl comes running up to Michelle in the street. It was right after Patricia's giving her a New York Herald Tribune mm -hmm. um, call because she's selling the newspaper. And this little, she's not little, she's probably like 12 or something, 13-year-old girl comes up and she's holding the Cahaya du Cinema. Yes, right. And Michelle kind of cringes. and Yeah. Because he was so, he was so, it was weird. He had this weird obsession with, with journalism and newspapers only reading that one newspaper because even Patricia uh, hands, him a, hands him a New York Herald Tribune mm -hmm. and he goes, on oh, no horoscope. Yeah, yeah. And then she goes, I guess could say horoscope. <laughs> but just that scene alone, the fact that Godard, or essentially Truffaut for writing this in the script, mm -hmm. wanted to put a physical representation, an accurate physical representation of the magazine or the publication Cahier du Cinema, Notes on Cinema, is very conceptual. I mean, yeah, and it, then he turns it away and she kind of shrugs and kind of makes this like stenchy face. Yeah. Like, what? You I don't remember, know anything. Yeah, You're I remember not she, reading this. She also asks him, Do you care about the youth? Right. Uh, and he says, No, I prefer old people. Uh, which, which is interesting. Why is she commenting on the youth when the. Does she mean. Or is, trans, or is Truffaut trying to say that the youth. The youth is 
identical to what film is producing? And, well, I, I, th- I think maybe what it could be represented because it, it is maybe the f- one, one of the film's most meta moments. Definitely. It, 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 it is it's definitely... Uh, yeah, being very aware that this is this film is made by the same people who wrote and, and you know, wrote their articles and their opinions in the Cahiers du Cinema, right? Um, and they also knew True Film Godard. They knew that they were a new generation of filmmakers. Right. So they, they they were they were making movies for for the youth for exactly. their generation. Yeah. So it, it was a, again a rejection of the filmmaking techniques that the older older generation and, and you know, established French cinema was using uh and and so i don't know i i think in some ways uh the character of michelle isn't supposed to necessarily be hip to that scene isn't supposed to be like himself someone who, who, who who cares about these things uh but uh but still godard feel feels it it necessary enough to uh Put he and his friends magazine in there and yeah. remind people, hey, we're making something this new. This is new. This yeah. is fresh. Our ideas are focusing on the youth mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and new ideas of of experimentation. Yeah. And on top of that, Godard himself makes a cameo in this movie. Do, Where? You, do you know that? So he's he's the one who he's reading a newspaper and he's the one who recognizes Michelle's face and, and sees it. In, oh. and so so Godard, and then asks Patricia, "Do you know who this is?" is or, that or, scene? He does. He doesn't ask Patricia, but he, he goes to the police that are nearby down the block and shows them the newspaper. Oh. He, he doesn't. He doesn't say any dialogue, but he's just on camera for a few shots. So he, the Godard himself, plays the character that eventually gets Michelle caught by the police. Got it. Which, which is interesting because I think it that that for one. Uh, most likely is a reference to the way that Hitchcock put himself in his movies. Yep. And so Godard yep. is, again, taking the influence from, from American and cinema. And Truffaut idealized Hitchcock. Yeah, yeah. And then, and, and, and then again, that, that meta aspect of having the filmmaker themselves invade their own movie to li- literally change the course of, of the main character's fate. Like, right. You know, the, that, that, that meta aspect was important to these filmmakers because... Again, they were always trying to re- remind people of that uh, they themselves were aware of filmmaking techniques and, and, and the influence it had. And so they, they, were, they were very conscious of almost wanting, wanting the audience to participate in, in their films. And so they did that by always making references to, to the director, to, yeah, to, to what they were, who, who, who they were, and the things they did. Because again, these were film critics before they were filmmakers. And I believe Truffaut also did that in 400 Blows. I think so, I mean, yeah. It's been a while since I've seen 400 Blows. I know that 400 Blows is highly based off of Truffaut's own childhood. Right, yep. Um, I can't remember if Truffaut himself has... 400 Blows is another fantastic, uh, great introductory film to French New Wave, uh, directed by Francois Truffaut. His first film, I believe. I think it was. So, yeah. Which, actually, I think that was actually my first... French New Wave film really? Corner Blows yeah I saw so, it in high school according to a lot of critics Breathless is essentially the birth of French New Wave yeah yeah so you could say technically that 1960 is when this film came out mm-hmm. is the is the beginning of French the New beginning New of French New Wave yeah uh, and again I, I remember in a, in a lot of of what, of what I've read Breathless is really credited as being this breath of fresh air to the film industry yeah. and, 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 and people who studied film that it yeah, gave birth to the French New Wave and yeah, it, it was a new style of filmmaking that just people hadn't seen before. So I'm going to ask our viewers, how many of you watched Breathless this weekend and have kept posted with uh, my last lecture? <laughs> and we'll see if we can get, get some comments and we'll see if we can actually respond to them. And if so, yeah, we can we can answer any questions because I think it's very interesting. You know, why would this one film be perceived as the birth of the French New Wave? Because because and, and two, it can be important to think about what were some of the other films that we usually think about as important French New Wave films. We've got Breathless, Four Hundred Blows, which I believe came just a year before Breathless in '59. Um, Jules and Jim, which is another true film movie, which came a few years later. Uh, masculine and feminine is another one, um, and generally Truffaut and Godard are the two filmmakers that 
we think of most when we think of the French New Wave directors. There's a few others like Agnes Varda. Yep. Um, Jacques Demy. Jacques Demy. Um, and, there's, and there's also sometimes filmmakers who are kind of seen as French New Wave. Um, and I can't remember his name, but he, he actually makes a cameo in Breathless as the novelist. Uh, it's totally, totally spacing who, who, what that director's name is, but he made a lot Which of... Which film? Um, in, in Breathless, he makes the cameo as the novelist, but he, he directed movies like uh, The Red Circle and Le Samurai. Um, Jean, P, Jean, Jean-Pierre... something, rather. Uh, <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna look this up real fast. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me, let me see if I can see any comments. Uh, hey, someone tuned in for both. Uh, I watched your class. Awesome. We appreciate it. Um, um you look up, uh, look up the red, the red, the red circle. Uh, okay. red circle. My life is yeah. a Navy or, uh, Seal. Uh, the Red Circle film. The Cycle Rouge. There we go. Directed by... Jean-Pierre Melville. Jean-Pierre Melville. That's what I'm trying to think of. Oh, um, look at this guy. Yeah, he... Yeah, again, he makes the cameo... Or he, he plays the novelist that... Yeah, there, that's that's the image from, oh, from the movie. Oh, that... Oh, my gosh. Okay, yeah. so this, this director is the scene... The kind of pretentious French novelists where there's like all these young journalists... Yeah, Girl, female journalist students who are like kind of drooling over him but also like right. think he's a genius like yeah. totally idealize him so that's super interesting was he making films before this film came out yeah so he was already an established director and so that's he, interesting yeah I, I think he was one of the French filmmakers that uh, the French new wave directors like Truffaut and Godard he was one of the, one of the few established directors that they looked up to and respected and so he's sometimes, even though he had an established career before New Wave came along, he sort of like was invited into that that circle of French New Wave directors. That's that so honestly, that's so comical because they pretty much just like put him on another pedestal in his in this film in mm-hmm. Godard's film to the fact like I don't know, it's kind of like it, it, I don't want to say misogynistic. Because they have these young girls. Well, she, well she, and she's... And she's flirting, or he's flirting with Patricia. Yeah, well, because she, she's the only fem- female reporter. All the, all the other all the reporters are male, and they're I all... I think there's asking, one more female, wasn't there? You might you might be right. But but definitely all the questions they're asking... Are, from all, males. ...are all about, you know, yeah. how many women can a man, man yep. you know, have in his life? Yep. Or, you know, how many, is, yeah, is, is there such women. a thing as love? Or what is the difference between love and lust? How many, um, how many French... Or, I think didn't the didn't the one girl ask how many like or was it the opposite how many women can one man have in a life or was it how many man, men can one woman have in a life yeah from yeah the yeah, girl? yeah and then, and, and that means like 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 yeah bring, bring up all, all all his fingers which again the answers that his characters his so character sexual gives are <laughs> completely uh, nonsensical like they they they're, they're not they're not really. It's almost like yeah, he is actively screwing with these these reporters. No pun intended. Yeah, <laughs> um, <gasps> and then yeah, which 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 again, I think the the use of that character is to sort of make fun of the way that artists in France at the time were often just so revered for being geniuses, right. even if they were just BSing people. What's also interesting is that Patricia. Well, A, Jean Seberg is American, mm-hmm. but Patricia is an American yeah, yeah, in yeah. this Her film, also American. which is, I mean, it's interesting in the sense that Godard and Truffaut were so influenced by American directors, but it's also the idea of putting a American, I'm assuming she was, I mean, her French was amazing. Right. And she was right. in other French films. Yeah. So I don't know how French she was considered, but by putting an American actress playing the the female lead, speaking French and also speaking English, mm-hmm. the that's another interesting topic is the the combination of French and English and mm-hmm. what that what that symbolizes. But it's it's interesting because it's like taking a piece of what could be considered this Hollywood era of film right. and putting it into this new wave, this new uh, 
set of guidelines, a set of aesthetic guidelines for mm -hmm. film. I know there's definitely one quote from Godard that I've read where he said that the characters of Patricia and Michelle, a, an American woman and, and, and a Frenchman, they're, they are having these you know, long conversations about what's important to them, but they never really talk about the same thing. He says, she's, obsessed, she's interested in living her life, he's obsessed with death, and so they, they never, they never f fully under, understand one another. Which you could definitely zoom that out to say that the perspectives that American filmmakers had and, and, and French filmmakers have, they weren't talking about the same things. Even though, even though they right. shared, shared an industry and shared an art form at the time, there was not a, there was, there, there was no common, common ground between what the subject matter of films from France and the U.S. were about. Well, it's also interesting because film noir didn't necessarily obsess over existentialism, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. There wasn't there wasn't a ton of philosophy being put into film noir, no, no. which is what was happening prior to French New Wave in America. So for Godard to bring in, you know, Marxism mm -hmm. and, you know, contemplating life and death, I think that was a new idea, which did inspire American avant-garde films to come after for sure, in the for 60s. Sure, for sure. Um, yeah, it, it's interesting because this movie is often thought about, some, or sometimes considered a film noir, um, but I think that's more just because it's so influenced by, by American movies, which, which were often film noir. Um, but this is actually kind of a good, good transition to talk about the other uh, film genre that we wanted to One talk thing about. I was going to say, though, actually, Sorry. I forgot to tell you this, that I had this, this aha movement for, uh, of Godard's influence from film noir. Michelle's character is the classic male lead. Mm -hmm. of a film noir the the intro he's doing this voiceover mm -hmm. which is pretty much always present in any in film, film noir, noir kind of you know uh male it's, lead angst kind of paranoid you know like it's, off, it's often the the detective's inner the, thoughts with, and he's got the fedora the, he's got the cigarettes he's, he's he's looking at images of humphrey bogart and oh Imitating yeah bogart. the humphrey bogart um shot was so symbolic Towards towards American influence on Godard and Truff and Truffaut, I think that was kind of a tipping of the hat, especially mm -hmm. the fact that it was at the beginning of the film. It's kind of like a, aha, uh -huh, okay, here we go, we're moving on yeah. to <laughs> something more, something more philosophical, something more existential. You know, it's 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 interesting because it it is kind of like a film noir scenario. This, in, yeah, this guy's ways. on the run. He's not a detective. Yeah, and he's also very aloof <laughs> and so naive, definitely, Michelle. Definitely. But yeah, uh, let's switch over to German Expressionism. Right? Uh, is, that what you were, is that the transition you were? That's, that that okay. is no, you are you are you are absolutely right. Um, yeah, because because I'm think we're thinking about how this this movie, particularly Breathless, that we were talking about, is influenced by a lot by by film noir, um, and the. Uh, film movement that really is the birth of film noir before uh, American cinema started using it is, is German Expressionism. Uh, and this is, yeah, again, the period after World War I uh, when it, was, it wasn't just actually in German filmmaking. It was a whole art movement in Germany, right. both in, in theater, in painting, yep. um, and any sort of visual art. It was, yeah. it was, it was taking its, it, it, its, its influence. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was mainly this... Um, Visual style, and what, what 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 would you describe the visual style of? I kind of label it as like creative distortion. Mm -hmm. Like everything was so new and so interesting, but it wasn't it wasn't always pleasant to look at. You know, it really made you feel something, and most of the time that was a very dark mood. Mm -hmm. And things were so extended visually, and I think. Um, emotionally mm -hmm. so you know i think that's kind of why i touched on edward munk because his work was so tragic but it was so brilliant in the sense that it was vibrant it was you know it was thought out it was portraying what he was feeling and i think the visual components that transition from his work into german expressionist film mm -hmm. had a huge influence on the set designs and the the non-linearity of what we were looking at, and and sure. also the 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 dra dramatic dramatized dramatic dramatization dra <laughs> the dramatization of these actors, like yeah. so like 
Oh my god, like the theater, the theater it's, influence. Yeah, 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 it was yeah. like we were watching a stage and all these sets were made on stage mm-hmm. by hand. Most yeah. of them were made by hand. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely agree that it yeah, it's usually when I think of German expression, I think about set design and, and a and a visual, visual visual language that is emphasizing uh emotions rather than like a physical reality and so oftentimes you'd have things like shadows would be physically painted on the set right or or, or the shapes so cool yeah yeah like the 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 shapes of the set since so would be very geometrical then there'd be hard hard edges of triangles and squares you know the the, the it, it was not an ac- accurate representation right. of the real of reality world. right and um, i think that's what's so interesting about french new wave because it's taking a little bit of that surreal, the, the surrealism I'd say in editing mm-hmm. and kind of the art direction, the mise-en-scene, but French New Wave was was more of a reflection towards reality when I think I think that German Expressionism was so much more right. I mean, yeah, you, surreal. You, you, you'd say that German Expressionism, Expressionism was a very, very constructive, a, 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 a constructed reality where, where they, they were working very hard to create this this different reality from our own whereas eventually 30 years later in, in French New Wave it was almost a guerrilla style filmmaking that was that was more more maybe more dreamlike yeah exactly a little, yeah a little yeah. more lighter on the palette you know not as not as dark and visually question you know mm-hmm. I feel like French New Wave was making you question things more philosophically when German expressionism was giving it to you very bluntly yes. in the visuals. Yes, yeah, yeah. Which was, which, and the, just little details like the color and the set design, that's what was so prominently taken from painting mm-hmm, and, mm-hmm. and theater. I'm Definitely. not as familiar with German theater, I'm probably as you are. <laughs> I mean, it's the, the the set design of, of German theater was often the same as the set design in, in the Expressionist films right. in the 20s. It looked very similar. Right. Because, yeah, the, the, the Expressionist films from Germany that were probably most influential were things like The Count of Dr. Caligari or... Which I um, talked about in the lecture, if yes. y'all watched it. <laughs> uh, also, Nosferatu being, yep. being, being, being a big one. Also big. Um, but then there was one that I, uh, I mentioned to you, which is a movie called M, directed M. by Fritz Lang. Um, who also did Metropolis, another very famous German expressionist film. That I spoke about in the lecture. Um, and M was actually Fritz Lang's first uh, talking film, whereas these other movies we usually talk about were silent, which most of the German expressionist films were silent movies. And so once talking uh, talking pictures came along, expressionism wasn't quite as prominent as, as what it, it was. Yeah, because be. this, I mean, the, the sound, but that's. How much of the original sound that was shown when the film was released is the same from the ones that we can go watch now? Right. I mean, some sometimes it would be live. Would be live orchestras. Yeah, it would have been live or or live piano in a theater. Sometimes there is still uh, written music that survives for movies that that filmmakers had had specific music written, but that wasn't always the case. Um, but with M being Fritz Lang's first talking picture, the the visual style that's still there is a very dramatic use of shadow. And so while the the overt set design isn't there like it used to be, there's still very much a use of having characters be either fully in darkness, maybe you know, ha- having a very specific shadow fall on them, and the way that uh, light and dark can be used to talk about who characters are, what they represent in the story, um, as, as well as, well as uh, again, eventually being a big influence on film noir, because actually a lot of these German filmmakers would flee to the U.S. as the Nazis came to power, and so they themselves became directors in Hollywood, and it would eventually influence film noir. Fritz Bang Lang being actually one of them who uh, directed a lot of a lot of film noirs, yeah, in in, in Hollywood when he when he, when, when he came. Um, so yeah, so that so there is 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 a bit of a a line from Expressionism all the, all the way to French New Wave and the way that Expressionism influences film noir, film noir infl- influences fr- French New That's, Wave. You know, that would make a really great like trifecta series mm-hmm. of German Expressionism, film noir, French New Wave. French New Wave. <laughs> and yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure you can definitely, you know, like, if, if you're looking for just specific things, you can track, you know, just the way that light and shadow is used or the way that maybe female characters are, are portrayed or the way you know the, the way the movies are, are a comment on 
the culture of society at the time that, that they come out. Right. Um, there's a lot that, that, that one can pick apart. Should we ask if people have any specific yeah, questions? Yeah, just opening it up to all of our viewers. Um, please feel free to drop in any questions if you did get to watch Breathless or if you have any questions for us on art film, any comments, any concerns about the film. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't necessarily like controversial in any way, even for the time. I wouldn't say that Breathless was pushing the boundaries much, except I mean, outside of the editing, outside of the, out of the artistic elements, but um, the... The, the actual content or the, or the yeah the dip, I'd say concept. the dip, what would you say on the depiction of Patricia's character because here she is living away from home in France yeah. she's she makes the comment you know I need uh, I need to stay in school so my parents can still send me money mm -hmm. you know she's working for a New York publication again this theme of journalism this theme of writers collaborating you know uh, American America having a voice in in journalism and film and mm -hmm. I think I think Patricia's character is actually pretty yeah, she's pretty like, androgynous in a sense she, oh, no, she, she definitely is androgynous yeah. um, I mean, why I, don't you wear a bra yeah I mean she is someone who is yeah re reflective of the actress Jean Seberg herself she was yeah. someone who was essentially yeah, re rejecting American norms and you know running away to Europe in a way yes and we yeah we were going to touch on this so, Jean Seberg, who played Patricia in Breathless, had a very interesting life and kind of a tragic outcome. Tragic, yeah, tragic story. Yeah. So, yeah, she not only was, you know, an expatriate, she... she Part of the Black Panthers, right? She, yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that is really what eventually brought her downfall, is that she was supportive of the Black, Black Panthers, and and so she was, she was mainly working in Europe as an actress because... Uh, essentially the U.S. government blacklisted her and so that she couldn't, couldn't Why, work in the though? U.S. Why, though? What was she doing that was so horrid? Because, uh, th again, this is the time of McCarthyism when, uh, you know, there, there were witch hunts for anyone who, who might be labeled a communist. And anyone who, 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 who deemed, uh, who was deemed in any way to be something that could be seen as anti-American. Right. And especially entertainers. That, that's why Joseph McCarthy went after Hollywood because there was this assumption that there were secret communists inf inf influencing American cinema. Um, What's his name? Uh, Joseph McCarthy. Uh, yeah, he, he's, he's the one that, that really led the, what was called the House of Un-American Activity. House of Un-American Activities. Oh, you're a Republican. Oh, what do you know? Uh, yeah, yeah, and so just the, the fact that Gene Seberg aligned herself with the Black Panthers or, or just the fact that she showed support to the Black Panthers essentially labeled her as a communist. Uh, at, at least label, labeled her as a communist in the perspective of McCarthy and, 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 and his, his side of the American politics. Was this even when she was doing films in the U.S.? Because she actually did a film in Oregon with Clint Eastwood. Uh, was it Paint Your Wagon? That, that's right. That's, the that, painted that, wagon. That, that's right. She uh, she was in pain. Your and wagon. was rumored to have had an affair with Clint Eastwood. Probably, of yeah. course. Yeah, yeah. That, 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 <laughs> that movie. Yeah, that movie had Clint Eastwood, and it also had uh, there's an, there's another famous actor that plays the the, the other part because Clint Eastwood's young in that movie. Um, is it Lee Van Cleef in in Paint Your Wagon? You know I can get. Oh, it was Lee, Lee Marvin. Marvin. Um, yeah, because yeah, I mean, Lee, Lee Marvin was one of these actors that made movies, made made westerns. He made you know crime films. Uh, he was he was definitely a big big star star in the fifties, and that one came out in sixty nine. So yeah, I mean, like that was that was right after Breathless. I mean, yeah, that that that's a movie that's really during the uh, American New Wave, right? Or, or the, the new well, Hollywood. the west, the western also. Yeah. It's, well, the yeah. western, the western was was a western formed. Well, well, the 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 really famous period of the westerns we usually think of is sort of the the forties and fifties, right. like a lot of the black and white stuff. Right. But, but by the time, but John Ford, yeah, and well, well, John, John Ford, Wayne, they, yeah, they they were they were the ones making those movies back when the the characters were very you know, good versus evil tales. Yeah, White Hat had some black hats, but then in the sixties there were westerns like uh, Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid, right. or even even you know the 
Italian spaghetti western yep. movies yep. that were just that was more sixties. Yeah, yeah, they, they became much darker films. They were the the revisionist westerns that they're sometimes called. Sorry, we're tapping the screen because <laughs> it blacks out. I didn't set the like the screen closing thing yeah, long yeah, enough. Yeah. So also, we're going to we're just going down a great rabbit hole. When, so <laughs> no, we're not. We're doing great. <laughs> Whenever this thing closes out, then we yeah. lose you guys. Should so be, what we be, were just what we were just talking just about. Safe was uh, Jean Seberg, who is the lead actress in Breathless and how she's had a very interesting life and has had a little uh, a little bit of a mystery behind her life. And I think that there was FBI associations with her death, but I'm pretty sure she yeah, she, the, she she committed suicide. Yeah, essentially, it seems drank, like... I think she drank the, herself to death, yeah, essentially. It seems like the pressure from the FBI was what eventually led led to her suicide. That's just so... All because she was associated with the Black Panthers. Yeah, or, or yeah, yeah, showed support to the Black Panthers, which, God forbid, you know, you have a political opinion. I guess we have evolved <laughs> semi. <laughs> but yeah, uh, for all of our new viewers, if you did get a chance to watch Breathless this last weekend, please add a comment or a question. We are here to help you. I think we went over a little bit of our time. I think yeah, a little bit, but hey, you know, we, 45 we'll, minutes, that's not so bad. Yeah, we'll stay, we'll stay on for a few more minutes. Um, um, let's see, what, what are we going to be talking about next week? Do we know? Yes, so I've got three more weeks for the month of January, obviously, to be teaching three different topics. And this next week, I will be focusing on the history of the American avant-garde. Nice. So going into how... French New Wave and German Expressionism, all the European art movements that influenced American filmmakers. So primarily in the in the sixties, I think I'm starting off with my Darren nice. which was which was forties, wasn't it? Yeah, she Pretty was sure. she was working even er, even earlier. Meshes yeah. of the afternoon, the afternoon, I think afternoon, came out in yeah, forty two? Yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, I mean she was an experimental 43. filmmaker for uh yeah, because, yeah, it's, it's not even a full-length feature film. So right, yeah, yeah so short, you know, short films, underground experimental. I'm going to focus also on um, San Francisco Underground nice. and how that was a little movement within itself, you know, really experimenting with celluloid and uh, lighting, um, performance art, and then how that's influenced more modern-day popular directors like David Lynch, mm-hmm, Stanley mm-hmm. Kubrick... Might even get into some Tarantino. I don't know. I'm trying to keep this a little, a little hip. <laughs> I'm not trying to get too pop culture here, but. Well, hey, you know, it turns out that watching old movies is worth it because you realize that so many modern filmmakers yep. are, are influenced by older, older films. Yeah, that's why studying film history is so essential because if you love the movies that have come out in the last decade and you ha- you're not that familiar with films that came out in the 20th century, Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the 20th century now we can we can we can definitely call it because we're 20 years out from you know the end of the 20th century. I know it's really weird. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. Forget I forget I'm living in the 21st century sometimes. Um, it's, it's, it still sounds like we're in like a sci-fi psycho thriller. <laughs> I mean, we kind of are living on right now. <laughs> totally. But um, you know, these are these are great films to keep along with, and you might see some similarities that are influencing directors that you watch. Even even Netflix series, even some of these shows are having. Totally. You know, these new, like, season after season after season, these kind of... Because, uh, yeah, honestly, one of the cool things about going back and watching, watching all, all movies... They all intertwine. Yeah, getting, getting, an influ- or getting an understanding of film history is you realize that great techniques that filmmakers use, you know, or even just a great shot or a great, you know, some, some sort of great sequence in a movie, oftentimes these tools and techniques have been used for you know, a hundred years. And so sometimes you, you can go back and you can see where the influence originally started from and you see why it was so influential, you know, this technique that, that you still te- see, see today. Even something as little as recasting the same actors. I was going to talk about this in my lecture, but like Wes Anderson mm-hmm. has adopted a lot of the same characteristics as past, you know, directors that could be considered, that would be considered auteurs, but mm-hmm. I mean, I think Wes Anderson would be considered oh, auteur at this point. Absolutely, yeah. Oh, yeah. But just, you know, the same recasting, the same actors. Yeah, it's, it's, it's that's a way a, of... That's a motif within itself that can definitely be critiqued as as an artistic element of the film. Yeah, it, it's like having your own, uh, like, 
little theater or your, your, your own cast repertoire that, you know, if you were local theater, you're, off, you're often using the same cast over and over again for different productions. So it, be, it, be, it sort of becomes a, a, an artistic choice and a stylistic motif that a director can use over and over again to explore different ideas with the same, same cast. Right. Uh, a familiar, you know, cast of faces. Which Woody Allen did a lot. Two, yeah, for sure, yeah, for sure. A lot. Uh, you can see. What's Tar- Anderson Tarantino? Tarantino does it. Um, what are there, some greats? I mean, I mean, really, that's Coen Brothers. They're yeah. They, oh they yeah, 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 yeah. Also use you know, direct a whole bunch. Like yeah. That was how I. That was how I discovered who Steve Buscemi was just by watching Coen Brothers movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, any last thoughts? Yeah, it all intertwines, man. <laughs> uh, um. For those of you that are watching, I would say it's great that you're following Ben Film on Instagram. This is definitely where we are posting the mo- the most about what's what we're doing. And for those of you that don't know, Ben Film owns Tin Pan Theater, which is where we are right now, which is in like the little Europe of Bend. If you live in Bend, Oregon, and you haven't been to Tin Pan Theater, you're missing out on a very artistic mm-hmm. experience because it's darling here and, and while we we aren't showing things inside at the moment we are doing programs in the alleyway outside uh and again if you follow the, uh, the ben film instagram we will keep you updated on when events happen and eventually when we will start slowly opening back up inside you know as this as 2021 un, uh, rolls out so for the next week, for I mean the rest of winter, we're pretty much planning every Thursday night. We are doing a alley film, which has primarily been ski themed, ski related. So if you're a local, if you're a local filmmaker that that is interested in you know outdoor videography, we are we are really stoked to kind of make a platform to create a community of our local filmmakers especially during the ski season totally yeah. so if we're not doing that we are doing like retro archival footage like snowboard 90s vibes to like great, great. 50s 60s like your dad teaching you how to cross-country ski vibes it should be the kind of stuff that after you've had a good you know day out in the snow you can come down to the alleyway have a drink and enjoy some goofy Goofy ski videos or just some great ski porn as, you know, <laughs> is, is the common common term these days. And we have a fire now in the alley, so it's cozy. We're right next to San Simone, which is super cute. Um, and, yeah, so this Thursday, I will also th- – no, this one – oh, my God. This, this coming Friday. <laughs> this Friday. Friday. Goodness. This Friday, I will be releasing my next lecture – of the month at 5 p.m. here on Instagram and Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and then the following Sunday we will be right here again doing this uh, IG live and discussion. If you have any questions about the film that I have assigned that weekend, thank you all for tuning in. We hope you learned something new about film history, and we're really excited to to get to talk to you all about some amazing amazing important facts that have influenced film today last thing i'll say if you enjoy this series if you enjoy these lectures if you enjoy anything we do at tin pan and through ben film uh if you can donate it's the one way that we can keep this going you can always go to the benfilm.org website you can find the donation page there uh and we should we'll, we should also try and start putting the link to that in anything we post so yeah. hopefully we'll have it in in this in following and following videos we'll have in the description below uh yeah but again if you can't donate we really appreciate it it's how we can keep keep these things going keep supporting independent cinema we love you all we hope that we can convert as many of you as we can to be film nerds like us (laughs) so keep watching movies stay posted on instagram for this next week's lecture i'll be teaching the his the uh History of the American Avant-Garde on Friday and then next Sunday we'll do the same format of an Instagram live to talk about the film. Cool. So thank you all for tuning in. I'm sorry to the new viewers. <laughs> but we'll see you next week. Yes. Stay safe, everyone. Wear a mask. Bye. Ciao.